Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And thank you for joining today's conference, the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat to me, the event producer. All audio lines have been muted until the end of the call. We will give you instructions on how you can make a verbal comment at that time. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. And with that, I'll turn the call over to David S. Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. Please go ahead. Good morning. This is David Ferriero, and welcome to our second virtual meeting of the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee and the final meeting of the 2018-2020 term. Once again, we join each other virtually rather than in person at the National Archives Building in downtown Washington, where I am currently perched. Two years ago, I appointed 20 FOIA experts from both inside and outside the government with a range of FOIA experiences and lenses to fulfill a broad mandate, advise on improvements to FOIA administration across the government. Since September 2018, three subcommittees looking at records management, time and volume matters, and a long-range vision for the FOIA have asked questions, studied answers, shared their FOIA experiences, brainstormed ideas and deliberated suggestions for improving the FOIA process. The full committee has voted on a majority of their proposals at its last three meetings. The result is a package of 22 far-reaching recommendations, 15 of which are aimed at federal agencies, including the Office of Government Information Services here at the National Archives. Other recommendations are geared toward the Chief FOIA Officers Council, the Council on Inspectors General for Integrity, and efficiency and Congress. Committee members, I look forward to your final deliberations today and to receiving the final report later this month. Thank you for your dedication to FOIA and to this committee. At the May 1st meeting, committee member Michael Morrissey noted, FOIA is a team sport. Indeed it is, and you have all exemplified that by working together, FOIA requesters and agency FOIA professionals toward a common goal, making the FOIA process work for all. Please note that I greatly appreciate your work, which dovetails nicely with the National Archives' strategic goal to make access happen. I especially appreciate the work done since the March 5th meeting, the majority of which took place during these difficult times in which life has frayed around the edges while we physically distance ourselves, face technological changes, and juggle caregiving responsibilities. We are not in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic, if we were not in, a, in the midst of a corona pandemic, I would present each of you with an Ojis Nara challenge coin and a handshake on the stage of McGowan Theater. We will find a way to get you your challenge coin eventually. In the meantime, please accept my gratitude and a virtual handshake for a job well done. And please note that I am committed to ensuring that your recommendations are carried out. Much of the work will be tasked to OGIS, which has done an excellent job of ensuring the, that the recommendations from the prior two terms of the committee are implemented. OGIS is in the midst of completing action on recommendations from the 2018-2020 term of the committee by assessing how agencies prepare documents for posting on agency FOIA websites and how agencies are incorporating FOIA performance standards into non-FOIA professionals performance plans and evaluations. Before turning the committee the meeting over to Chairperson Aline Simo, I wanted to let everyone in attendance know that on May 7th, I signed the charter for a fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. OGIS will solicit nominations from both the federal agency and FOIA requester communities. And in accordance with the charter, I will appoint members for the 2020-2022 term of the committee representing cabinet-level departments, smaller agencies, as well as requesters with a variety of FOIA perspectives. The new committee of 20 members is expected to hold its first meeting on September 10th. Take care, stay safe, and be well. And I now turn the meeting over to Alina Simo. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today as the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and this committee's chairperson. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second-ever virtual meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee. 
and also the ninth and final meeting of the 2018-2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I can't believe it's been two years already. I hope everyone who's joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Despite the challenges we have all been facing during the COVID-19 pandemic, I am very proud to say that the FOIA Advisory Committee has continued to stay engaged and focused on the task at hand to finish out this third term with an impressive 22 recommendations for the Archivist of the United States and a draft final report that we will be discussing and finalizing today. I wanna thank each and every one of you on the committee for your contributions, your passion, and your commitment to developing consensus recommendations for improving the administration of FOIA across the federal government. Behind the scenes in the last few months and throughout the past two years, several of you deserve an extra special thanks for the hard work you have put in to get us to this point. I would like to recognize in particular Records Management Subcommittee co-chairs, Jason R. Barron and Ryan Law, Time Volume Subcommittee co-chairs, Emily Creighton and Bradley White, and Vision Subcommittee co-chairs, Joan Kaminer and Chris Knox. To get us into this home stretch, uh, the working group who pulled this report together deserve a special thanks as well. That would be Jason R. Barron, Avi Moshine, Sean Moulton, and Patricia West. Behind the scenes, we could not have gotten to this point without all of the hard work of the committee's designated federal officer, GFO, Kirsten Mitchell. And I want to recognize the support of our NARA historian, Jesse Kratz, who has given us for the past several months uh, lots of help uh, behind the scenes and has assisted us with the work of the committee. Thanks also to OGIS's Crystal Lemelin for her oversight, care, and feeding of the committee's website and the Eventbrite RSCPs. Um, also, a thank you to our Office of General Counsel colleague, Rana Kandahar, who has provided us with valuable legal guidance and advice regarding the Federal Advisory Committee Act and ethics issues. As the archivist mentioned in his opening remarks this morning, he has renewed the committee's charter for fourth term, 2020 to 2022. I am excited to continue to chair the next committee term, as long as David agrees. Uh, please be on the lookout for a federal register notice that will be coming out in the next few days soliciting nominations for the 2020-2022 term. The deadline for nomination submissions is July 2nd. As we have in the past, we are happy to consider both first party and third party nominations. Sorry, that was a bit of FOIA humor there. Uh, the first meeting of the 2020-2022 term is scheduled for Thursday, September 10th. So please mark your calendars. Next, I would like to cover some housekeeping rules, review our general agenda for today, and along the way, set some expectations for today's meeting. So first, a few housekeeping notes. As most of you know, the FOIA Advisory Committee, which reports to the Archivist of the United States, provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public the opportunity to provide their feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. We encourage public comments, suggestions, and feedback that you may submit at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov. Meeting materials are available on the committee's webpage. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as it is available to the committee webpage. Information about the committee, including members' biographies and committee documents are available on the 2018-2020 FOIA Advisory Committee OGIS website. I invite everyone joining us today to visit the committee website and that way we can dispense with introductions of the committee members today. 18 of the 20 committee members are participating. Today, uh, Sarah Kotler of the Food and Drug Administration and Avi Moshine of the Consumer Product Safety Commission are unable to join us today. To promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, we post committee updates and information to our website, blog, and on Twitter at FOIA underscore ombud. Stay up to date on the latest OGIS and FOIA Advisory Committee news, activities, and events by following us on social media. As I mentioned at our May 1st meeting, the virtual environment in lieu of the in-person medium has many advantages, including much shorter commutes for all of us and a more casual Thursday. Last time we met on a Friday, so it's easier to say casual Friday. 
The disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we will not be able to see you raising your hand or eagerly leaning forward, ready to make a comment or ask a question uh, when, as when we were meeting in the Gallon Theater. Although I will be doing my best to monitor nonverbal cues during the webcast, we will all need to be respectful of one another and try not to speak over one another, although I realize that may be inevitable at times. I want to encourage all committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop down menu and the chat function if they want to raise their hand and speak. You can also just chat me directly. But I uh, just want to remind everyone in order to comply with the spirit and intent of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, I want to ask committee members to please keep communications in the chat function to housekeeping and procedural matters. Uh, and not make any substantive comments, those you should be making uh, by speaking on the record. Um, Kirsten will be chatting with our event producer today to uh, ask him to make any language changes that we're going to be talking about today uh, as part of the process. Um, but otherwise, if you chat something substantive, it will not be recorded in the transcript of the meeting. Another important reminder, if you need to take a break today, uh, please do not disconnect from either the audio or video of the web event. Instead, please put your phone on mute or continue to keep it on mute and close your camera and then join us again as soon as you can. Also, please remember to identify yourself by name and affiliation each time you speak during the meeting. I'm guilty of always forgetting that myself, but I have to remind everyone. Uh, this does help us with the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. We have posted the agenda for today's meeting on the 2018-2020 FOIA Advisory Committee website. Our goal as a committee today is to vote on one best practice that is now reverted to a recommendation, discuss as necessary any comments that have been submitted by both committee members and members of the public, and discuss, finalize, and vote on the final report of this committee. I promise that although there is no break on the agenda, if we need to do so, we will take a 15-minute break at a logical point. Although my overall goal is to try to give all of you back the gift of at least one hour and end by noon. After the committee has deliberated, but before we take a vote on the final report, we plan to open up our telephone lines to welcome public comments, and we look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. Jessie Kratz, the National Archives historian, will be monitoring the chat function. I will ask her to read out loud any questions or comments during the public comment period as well. After our May 1st meeting, the final report working group met weekly, more often as needed sometimes, to pull together the draft report based on the recommendations the committee passed. We posted a final draft on our website on May 21st and promoted it via our blog post and NARA social media. We also circulated the final draft among the committee members and encouraged all of you to read it in advance of today's meeting so you can be prepared to raise any concerns or issues before we get ready to vote. We have realized that we have uh, forgotten to post the two appendices uh, on our website. Uh, we will take care of that uh, right after this meeting and make sure that the two appendices go up one of which is the charter itself. The second is a, I believe, a two uh, summary that has been put together by uh, committee member Jason R. Barron. Um, and uh, I apologize for that, but we will fix that error. I want to move on now to approve the meeting minutes from our May 1st meeting. And uh, Kirsten has circulated by email um, those minutes to all committee members. I do not believe that we got any comments to any of those committee meeting minutes. Kirsten, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, later today, Kirsten and I will certify the minutes to be accurate and complete, which we are required to do under the Federal Advisory Committee Act within 90 days of our last meeting, so we're way ahead of schedule. Um, so if I can have a motion to approve the minutes in their current form, I would appreciate that. So moved. It's Jacob, so moved. I'm sorry, who was moving? I missed, I missed who was moving. That was James Jacobs. That was James Jacobs. It wasn't James Stoker. Okay, thank you, James Jacobs. Um, I'm happy to take a second. 
Second, Sussman. Thank you, Mr. Sussman. All present in person uh, on video webcam in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Okay, anyone opposed, please say nay. Anyone abstaining from the meeting minutes? Okay, uh, it sounds like there are no abstentions and no nays. It sounds like we have unanimously passed them. The May 1st minutes are approved and we will post them on the committee website. Kirsten, we're good? Okay, I'm gonna move on. I'm going to re-review the voting procedures. I try to do that every time because we used to be able to hand them out to committee members and there are uh, our folders. We're not able to do that right now in this virtual environment. Uh, but briefly, any member of the committee can move to vote on any recommendation. Although the motion does not need to be seconded, it seems like we've been doing that for a while, so I'm going to continue that practice. It seems to make us feel better. The vote can pass by unanimous decision, which is when every voting member except abstentions is in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. General consensus, which is when at least two thirds of the total votes cast are in favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. And general majority, which is when a majority of the total votes cast are in favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. In the event of a tie, we will reopen discussion and the committee will vote to, uh, will continue to vote until there is a majority. If you are in favor, favor of a recommendation, please say aye. If you are against a recommendation, please say nay. And if you do not wish to vote, please say abstain. In this current virtual environment, we will take a voice vote, uh, but I will make sure we pay particular attention to any nays and abstentions. Kirsten, our DFO, will record and announce the results of any and all votes that we take today. We will then open the floor to the committee for a period of general comments, questions and feedback about recommendations today and after comments, questions and discussion, um, I will ask uh, whether the committee is prepared to take a vote. Uh, today, I'm anticipating taking a vote only on uh, two items, the uh, final report itself, as well as the best practice, which is now reverted to a recommendation. So uh, before I go on, I just wanna check in with the committee. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, right. silence is golden. Okay, uh, let's so, move on. I, I, do have, I do have one thing. Um, I really yeah, could have brought this up earlier, but it just kind of jumped out at me looking at the screen now. I, I think we need to have our cameras on. Um, I realize we were kind of talked about who might be confusing, but we managed to the last meeting, and this is a transparency group. I mean, it seems if we were in the gallon, people would see all of our reactions. Yeah. You alluded to this. I, I, you know, it doesn't feel right to me that we don't do that. Yeah, I, Kevin, I second. We have been together for two years, we managed to. Sorry yeah, to be an advocate about this, but it just, just, once I saw it here, it did not feel right. Right, and I actually, I'm able to display on my laptop screen everyone's um, little squares, so hopefully everyone is able to do that. I believe Patricia has been the only one sort of in the minority who has not been able to turn on her webcam, but we all know what she looks like. I get uh, that. I get that there's issues. And I understand people may not want to, but I'm just going to say I'm going to do it. And, you know, people can I make their own choices. It's still to me. Yeah, and, and some people have dressed up for this meeting today. I want to recognize Chris Knox and James Stoker and Bradley White. Um, and I'm just thinking oh, not. Tom, Tom, Tom is wearing not a jacket. Some of the other committee members are wearing jackets. I'm gonna just give you kudos for, for that. But yes, Kevin, I agree. I, it makes it uh, much easier for me as well. So thank you for that. Okay. okay. Once I saw it, it's different. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, any other comments or questions about everything I've gone over until now? Because if we don't have anything else, I'm gonna keep moving forward to uh, talk about what we're gathered all to talk about today primarily, which is the final report. Um, I have a few comments. I just wanted to set the stage before we get into a substantive discussion. Uh, the working group made a great effort to integrate the three subcommittees reports into one complete document. 
Groupings of recommendations into subcategories mean that recommendations appear in a different order than in the subcommittee reports. Um, if anyone wants to compare the two, we have posted the three subcommittee reports on our website. Uh, in the interest of clarity, the working group took some drafting liberties, I'm saying that in air quotes for those who can't see me, um, to include modest revisions of the precise wording of certain of the committee's recommendations, but uh, the group made every effort to uphold the substance of the recommendations as previously voted on by the entire committee. The working group also used some editorial discretion to craft supporting text for each recommendation that adhere to what was set out in the subcommittee report, supplemented with additional text and, uh, as you might have noticed, lots of citations. Uh, believe it or not, despite the current length of the draft report, I believe we're at 42 pages, uh, the working group elected to shorten some of the accompanying rationales in the subcommittee reports while retaining the substance of what was said. As the working group looked more closely at the survey results of FOIA personnel and requesters, we were challenged with reconciling percentages contained in the last draft version of the survey. So in the draft report, the working group used its discretion to remove sites to uh, percentages of the survey results, replacing them with um, what arguably are less precise, but nevertheless still useful language that conveys the overall message of the results. Uh, nevertheless, the final version of the time volume subcommittee report has been posted on the committee's website, and uh, it has appended to it the actual survey results so that interested readers and committee members can delve further if they would like. In addition, the records management and vision subcommittees reports have been updated and reposted on the committee website to reflect a more final version. So uh, first order of business, I would like to call everyone's attention on the committee to recommendation number 13, which uh, had formerly been voted on by the committee as a best practice. Um, I thought, in particular, this would make Bradley very happy, uh, since we sort of uh, uh, managed to persuade him to move his recommendation to a best practice, but we really found that um, in re, uh, and revisiting all the recommendations and in writing the report, the working group really thought that it, it just flowed much more smoothly to uh, revert back uh, from a best practice to a recommendation. So I, I hope all of you agree. Um, we also thought it would just look a little bit odd to have a single best practice sticking out all on its own. Um, so we are uh, recommending that we put it back as a recommendation. It is currently number 30. I will read it out loud in case everyone doesn't have it in front of them. Um, and I believe that um, if I could ask our event producer, Bijou, to please go to further down to get into recommendation number 13, just so we have it in front of us. Is that possible? It's up, Alina. It's up, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, just to read it out loud, for those of you who cannot see the slide, we recommend that agencies conduct a comprehensive review of their technological and staffing capabilities within two years to identify the resources needed to respond to current demands. Um, so again, because we passed it as a committee, as a best practice at a um, prior meeting, I thought it was important that the committee vote on it in its present form as a recommendation. So uh, first, I just want to invite any thoughts or comments on this. If there are none, I'm happy to proceed to a vote. Okay, I'm seeing everyone nodding. Uh, so uh, if we could please vote on uh, recommendation number 13 in its present form. All those in favor, please say aye. Say aye. 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 Okay, anyone who uh, would like, oh, I heard a late aye. Anyone who is against the recommendation, please say nay. Anyone who wishes to vote to abstain? This is Bobby from OIP, and I'll continue to abstain. Okay, thanks, Bobby. I'm going to vote aye on this one. So, Kirsten, do you want to read out the results of our vote, please? Yes, the recommendation number 13 passes 
um, unanimously with Bobby Talabian abstaining. Okay. All right. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Bradley, are you happier? Yes. Okay. Good job. Um, okay, so next I would like to invite several different committee members um, to provide us with their thoughts on some language tweaks that they would like to offer up. I, I personally do not think they, they rise to the level of needing to take a formal vote on each one. Um, my intent is to just vote them in as part of our final vote on the uh, package of the final report, but if anyone disagrees, I'm happy to discuss after each committee member introduces their tweets. So um, if I could uh, first turn to Bobby, please. Uh, and I try to do this in the order in which uh, the recommendations appear on the slides. We are now back to recommendation number one. Bobby has a small language tweak he would like to offer up for recommendation number one. Thanks, Alina. Um, just a small tweak, and I think it's on uh, the next slide that shows you kind of what, what the tweak would be, but uh, it reflects more of what the rationale describes and that OIP would be issuing the guidance. That's really all, all there is to it. Yep, a clarification. Um, and so I'm just gonna turn to Tom for one minute. He had raised earlier a question about whether the language flowed well enough in recommendation number one. Does Bobby's fix tweak, uh, fix your issue. Yeah, it, it does. You know, my concern was a grammatical one, basically, uh, that for the purpose of OGIS and OIP it didn't, it did not make sense, but this, this does it, this does it. Okay. Uh, I, support, right. I support this amendment. Okay. All right, uh, any other comments from committee members on uh, Bobby's proposed language tweak? All right, and let me just poll everyone. How does everyone feel about the need to take a vote on this individually, or can we just vote on it as part of the final package? Final package. Final package. I got a thumbs up from Emily. Thank you. Okay, thumbs up from Sean. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, so it seems like there's consensus. We don't need to vote on it separately. Um, so that takes care of recommendation number one. Yay, we did it. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm now going to turn uh, turn it over to Sean uh, Moulton, who is going to discuss his changes to recommendations number three and 12. So let's start with three, Sean. Sure. Um, and the, the changes in both of these are uh, pretty much uh, identical. Uh, you'll see uh, that basically I'm just removing uh, OGIS and OIP from uh, the target of the recommendation. Um, both of these were uh, uh, ones where we asked OGIS and OIP to encourage agencies to do something. Uh, and instead, since we've um, discovered that we can make recommendations directly to agencies, I'm saying we should make the agencies the, uh, the target of the recommendation, just recommend that the agencies do whatever work uh, that we, uh, we envisioned for these. So this one is, as you'll see, uh, online access uh, through standardized uh, ways um, and uh, websites. So uh, instead of saying OGIS and OIP, encourage them to, to collect and release the, the FOIA records to say agencies work towards the goal. So does that get us off the hook, OGIS and OIP? Should we be celebrating? I will point out that the language beneath the uh, Recommendation still mentions heavily OGIS and OIP and uh, what we envision them uh, doing to help the agencies, so. I tried, Bobby. <laughs> okay, um, anyone have any questions uh, regarding Sean's proposed uh, change? This is James Jacobs. Yeah. Oh, Stanford James University. Jacobs. You beat James. Yeah. Um, okay. I just wanted to say thanks to Sean to, uh, to make this recommendation a little bit more clearer and also um, pointing out that the, um, that the describing text under the recommendation um, includes OGIS and OIT uh, because I think if we just say 
we recommend that agencies do this. Um, how are we going to get the agencies to know about this recommendation? So I'm glad that OGIS and OIP will still be in the mix. Sorry, Alina. <laughs> no, no, no. I, um, okay, I saw Jason R. Baron raising his hand. Jason, do you have a comment? Well, the um, I am supportive of of the change by Sean, but uh, this was calibrated in the in its original form and discussed in a prior public meeting, uh, so as to balance. Um, uh, the ability of agency or to take into account the ability of agency to do this. Um, and I think it's important as noted by the last two speakers that um, OGIS and OIP are vehicles to encourage agencies to work towards this goal. So um, by omitting uh, an express reference, I would hope that the Final report is still um, uh, encouraging agencies through the vehicle of OIP and OGIS to to affect this. It would be, I, I think, it's just more effective with Bobby's voice than your voice, Selena, um, in doing this. No, we we understand that, and we certainly will rise to the challenge. Right. Bobby? Uh, with Yes, that's exactly right. I don't see it any different for us. Okay, you're now on the record, Bobby. All right, anyone else have any other comments or questions? Bradley White, DHS, uh, this still works and with my concerns, so I have no issues with this language. Okay, great, thanks, Bradley. How do folks feel about uh, whether we need to vote on the new language, or do you think it's sufficient to vote on it as part of the final package? Final package. Final package. Thank you, Mr. Final package. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Anyone feel differently? Anyone feel differently? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move all right, well, Sean, thank you. Do you want to go on to number 12, or do you feel like we should at least pull up the slide, right, even though you've covered the essence? But yeah. So our, can our, thank you. Here we go. PowerPoint number 12. And you'll see the same thing here. Uh, just removal of, of OGIS and uh, OIP, and this is, um, you know, encourage or actually recommend that agencies release documents uh, in machine readable, legible, uh, actionable, extent feasible. So a uh, very similar change. Sean, any comments? Any comments? This is Emily. I just, I, I wondered if, um, is, is the re maybe it's a little bit of explanation around the reasoning. Is this to place more of the burden on the agency to take action? Um, because I think folks have noted the importance of OGIS and OIP working with the agencies. And so I'm just wondering if that, I understand it makes it a little cleaner to read, but I just wondered if, if it was actually to, to you know, put some more, you know, mandatory language there for the agency. I just didn't know what the reasoning was. Uh, I mean, it's, I guess that's uh, along that vein. I wouldn't call it mandatory language or anything. It's still just a recommendation to the agencies. I think what I was envisioning was um, under the, the current structure of the recommendation, uh, if OGIS and OIP did something to encourage the agencies um, to accomplish either, either of these recommendations, and even if no agency changed anything, technically the recommendation would have been satisfied because OGIS and OIP would have encouraged. And I felt that the recommendation was really for there to be at least some movement uh, in this area. So I just thought we should say it that way, that, that this is what we're recommending, this uh, this uh, change 
and, I, and I didn't want to change the uh, underlying text because I do see a, an important role for OGIS and OIP in, in trying to make this change, but I, I felt like we should just um, recommend uh, straight to the agencies the change that we envision. So, Emily, you're good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Sean on number 12? Okay. Well, uh, Alita, yeah. uh, this is uh, nominally similar to Sean's other recommendation, but um, if my recollection is correct, this was even more um, calibrated to address concerns of one or more members on behalf of their agencies that the agencies might not be able to, in the short term, do anything like this. And again, I myself have no objection, but I'm voicing what I thought was a concern. I think there were issues in both directions at, at a prior public meeting where some on the committee wanted the language to be stronger um, than what we had it then, and others were uh, cautious about what their agencies were capable of. And so I defer uh, to anyone on the committee to speak up um, if they have any heartburn over this. Bradley White, DHS. Um, my issues here are also still addressed, uh, especially with the inclusion of, continued inclusion of to the extent feasible. Um, so I'm still okay with this one. James Jacobs, I just want to echo my, my former comments and my prior comments and note that OGIS and OIP are both um, mentioned in the recommendations uh, comments and description. So I'm fine with it too. Okay. I, I just said this, to me this approach just makes this, it just adds to a best practices kind of uh, flavor where it's, it's a recommendation for OGIS and OIP to do something, but it also highlights the best practice for agencies to, to that we can convey and that they can look to that the that the uh, that the committee um, is supporting. So I, I see it as that angle. I think that's fine from that angle. Okay. Yeah, this, this is Tom Sussman. Comment. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, I think it's especially important that. Uh, OGIS and OIP be involved here. I, I, I wouldn't oppose the change, but uh, as you know, I, I was, have been concerned about the language to the extent feasible, because I think you give me a tough task and say do it to the extent feasible, I'm going to find it not feasible if I don't want to do it. Uh, and so I think there definitely needs to be some outside supervision, accountability, assistance, encouragement, et cetera, on something uh, where if people if we maintain this qualification. I think that language was this about from I think that language is added in there to give flexibility for unknowns. But obviously the what we're 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 aiming for um both OIP just would be um to fully embrace um uh, this, you know, level of posting in, in, in machine readable format. But with unknowns, you know, it's part of this action is going to involve a little bit of study on our part. Okay. I'm not seeing anyone else raising their hand. So um, again, same question as I've asked for the others. Anyone feel the need to vote on this uh, now in this new form, or are we okay to vote on it as part of the final report? 
choose your adventure. One or two? Two. Okay. Final two. report is fine. This is James Jacob. All right. Thank you, James. Okay. Um, so that takes care of now recommendations one, three, and 12. I'm going to now turn it over to Ryan, who wanted to discuss, discuss a proposed tweak to recommendation number eight. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ryan Law from Treasury. Uh, let's wait for the slides to catch up here. Uh, if you could go to the, perfect, thank you. Um, so looking at this recommendation, uh, which I think is a great one, um, there's a lot of discussion in the narrative about the purposes for by which we're recommending this. And uh, as it was previously written, it only uh, included the goal of encouraging agencies to improve their internal processes. I recommend that we add um, another really important uh, goal, which is to improve and increase public transparency to agency FOIA processes. Um, and so I felt the need to bring that up into the uh, into the actual recommendation. So I wanted to see if anyone had any concerns or questions or comments about that. Or comments about that. Really this is a great addition. Yeah, same thing. I think it strengthens it and makes it a lot better. I agree. Okay, so just for the record, that was Emily Creighton who said. She likes it, right? Okay, yes. And then who was the second person that spoke? I that was me, it. Bradley. Bradley. Oh, and Bradley. I said I thank you. And Bobby also likes it. Okay. Uh, Jason raised his hand. Um, I, I support it. Uh, Ryan and everyone, uh, just to make it cleaner, is there a reason to have the clause into agency FOIA processes uh, because the word processes, uh, why not just say to increase public transparency and to encourage agencies to improve their internal processes? This is Ryan. Uh, Jason, I agree with that, that modification. So just so we're all clear, we're going to just keep the phrase to increase public transparency and strike into agency FOIA processes. So it will read to increase public transparency and to encourage agencies to improve their internal processes, correct? Correct. Okay, Ryan, is that good? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, any other comments on on this particular tweet for recommendation number eight. And again, unless I hear any objections, we're not gonna vote on it separately. We're going to vote on it as part of the whole package. I'm waiting for any objections to come in. Thank you, Kevin, for nodding. I appreciate that. Um, okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so Tom, I would like to turn it over to you. You would like to discuss a tweak to recommendation number 18. Yep, I guess so. I, I think this is, my recollection is that this is a non-substantive, not a 18, no. No, that's not me. That's not you? No. You, well, no, I thought it was you. You just have like a slight wording change that I don't think is substantive, but no, we just decided we should just let everyone see it. Uh. Yes, but that wasn't the 18th. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you had uh, indicated. I'm trying to find out where it was. Oh. Yeah. Was Alina, I actually think this is a substantive change. It's uh -huh. changed. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I see. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> I I didn't care for the how agencies have been doing, okay, how agencies are doing. Now, that just seems like really, really strange to me. Uh, how are they doing? Uh, for, for a formal recommendation to the advisory committee, I, 
I'm not necessarily limited to how successful they have been, but um, I, I do think I do think that the, I, I was kind of put off by the initial language. I apologize, but I mean, I kind of That's okay. got distracted by the limit uh, and mark out there. No, I only had a momentary moment of panic. It's all gone. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. A, so thanks, Tom. Uh, Jason, you think this is substantive. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, the, uh, Tom, the, uh, the only, I, I don't have an objection, but the, but I think we should all recognize what this change means. The, the recommendation is for an ongoing priority. So it's not a one-time thing uh, of a, of a cross-cutting project or priority area. And so the languages are doing is an active uh, component of this recommendation that's a going forward component. It's not just a one-time assessment of what has been done. I agree, however, that um, in the usual case, what IGs do is do an audit or um, some kind of look into what an agency has done, but they also make recommendations for the future. So I will so say Jason, that. Jason, how about how about putting the word are instead of have have been, so that then yeah. makes it current. How would it read? How, uh, for priority area, the issue of how successful agencies are in providing FOIA access to agency records. That would be more faithful to the way that it was originally drafted. I, you know, I again, I don't have an objection to what you're doing, but I, I, I hope no, you well, recognize I, the point. I take I take your point of, of it not being an assessment of the past, but an encouragement of continuing conduct, and I think that change that our uh, responds to your concerns, I hope. It certainly would be fine with me. I just was trying to get away with, uh, from the how agencies are doing. Well, I support your latest amendment. All right, Sean has been raising his hand very patiently. Uh, I just had a, a, a variation, I think, on what Tom was uh, trying to change and maybe a little bit uh, simpler. Uh, if we made it uh, uh, read uh, the issue of agencies' performance in providing FOIA access um, might capture all of this. Um, well, I, I, this is Jason. I, that also seems like a good word, however, it could be read by some as limiting. And we we do have the word performance in the recommendation uh, inspired by Suzanne's work on performance plans. So I wouldn't want that to be a delimiter in what the IG scope is. Sean, this is Emily. It's part of the... Sorry, raising my hand. Sorry. I couldn't hear your comment, Alina. I, I just, I'm sorry, I just asked whether you wanted to withdraw your suggestion or do you want sure. to- Sure, I mean, I, I, it, if it's uh, not seen as, as helpful, then that's fine. I, I'm actually fine with uh, Tom's how successful agencies uh, are in providing. Okay. Boy, I, I think I just wanted to resolve that. Um, Emily, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking, I think, the need, there's need for language here around the fact that the success is being measured in some way. I mean, and maybe the how is just the way to do that, but to simplify it, cross-cutting project or priority area, designating as cross-country project or priority area, it's really the success of agencies in providing FOIA access. I mean, all of those words sort of say that, I think. Um, but I don't know if how successful it has sort of sounds like you're measuring it a little bit more. Um, but I also think you could just say the six, the agency's success in. Oh. 
Can I ask, I believe this is a records management subcommittee recommendation. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Correct. Jason, can I have Jason and Ryan comment on uh, what Emily just said? And of course, invite the other com subcommittee members to comment as well. Uh, Ryan, I'll defer to you. I, I, I'm sorry, I, uh, this is Ryan. I don't feel strongly. I, I, I think uh, I support the, the edits here. And, and Emily, I'm sorry, I, I might have missed your point. I think that there's just been discussion about have been referring to past um, activities and that there needs to be sort of language about um, current ongoing work. Um, and there was just also a discussion about simplifying the language. I just, I'm not sure. I think, um, I think R in providing was the previous suggestion. I think that's fine. And I just suggested additional language that would make it even simpler, but I think it might take away some of the measuring there. Um, so I would, maybe I'm, I think that either R or just saying the issue, cross cutting project or project area, the success agency success in providing. Um, so I think either of those would be fine. What I recall- That's the same I, paper. Uh, I'm sorry, James. I was just gonna make a quick point. I seem to recall this recommendation was intended to have Siggy designate this cross-cutting project in order for them to, in fact, measure. Um, how agencies are performing, right? Wasn't that the original intent of this recommendation? Well, the, so I don't know. This, the original intent, this is Jason, was to get this on the radar screen of IGs and how they did that, um, you know, was really up to them. Uh, I'm not sure I'm seeing the difference, Emily, in the language you're proposing. So I, I like the language that Tom has proposed and would just suggest that we we uh, stick with that. So R versus yep. have been? <laughs> right. Yeah, strike okay. the word doing. That's fine. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. I think so. Okay, I'm this, sorry. This, is, this is James Tucker. I, I, I agree with that. And I just wanted to note that in the content of the recommendation, it, it suggests that, uh, that the review that takes place could could take the form of an auditor review of how agencies are planning to meet the goals set out in M1921. So it makes reference to a specific document that should be used as a standard for measuring this. And because it's, it's making this specific reference to a document, I'm not sure if it really matters too much whether we say they're successful in doing it or just whether they measure how they do it, right? I feel like we're, we're splitting hairs a little bit there. Anyone else want to comment or offer up another language suggestion? Or are we are we all good with successful agencies are in providing FLIA access? Yeah. Kevin is nodding. Thank you, Kevin. Sean is nodding. Ryan's nodding. Um, okay. It seems like we have consensus on that. Kirsten, are you able to reflect that in the changes that we're making? Yes, just let me read it, please, yes. um, to make sure that I have it correct. Um, we recommend the chair of SIGI consider designating as a cross-cutting project or priority area the issue of how successful agencies are providing FOIA access to agency records in electronic or digital form. Uh, if are, we, we, keep, are we leaving then the word in before providing? or did yeah. you Drop that. I dropped it, I'm sorry. So how successful agencies are in providing FOIA access to agency records in electronic or digital form. Okay. Yes. All right, so Tom, you're good with that, obviously. Yes. Um, okay, anyone else wanna comment? And does anyone feel like we need to vote on this separately? No, we're gonna vote on it, op, my option, adventure number two, we're gonna vote on it as part of the package. Okay, I'm seeing lots of P signs. Okay, 
All right, great. Well, thank you for all of that. Uh, I want to move on next to uh, Jason, who would like to discuss very briefly, not a bridge to the future, but looking to the future. I mistakenly called it a bridge to the future um, earlier. Uh, at the end of the report, he is the proud author of that, and um, he wanted to share with all of you what his thinking is behind, you know, putting that as part of the report. Jason, is that a fair characterization? Sure. Uh, I'm trying to get up to the page here on my other computer so that I can faithfully say it. We added uh, an ending here in the report that's a little bit um, different and what we, we really haven't discussed it as a committee, and so I wanted to point it out. It's under final observations on page 35 of the report itself. Um, under the page numbering of the report. Uh, what uh, we say uh, in the third and fourth paragraphs is that without intending to bind any member of the next term of this committee, uh, we do have a suggestion. And the suggestion is that because this term of the committee proposed 22 recommendations, if you um, add up the 22 recommendations we've done and the recommendations that Martha's been reporting on to us um, from the last term and, and even the first term, it's a lot of recommendations. And so uh, it was our thought that um, members may want to uh, spend a portion of their time um, essentially measuring or evaluating compliance with prior recommendations rather than solely being tasked at the outset uh, to go forth and dream up another 22 recommendations or however many that uh, they might have. And so we're simply uh, making a suggestion here um, as to uh, what uh, sort of uh, opening up the space of what the next committee might proceed to do. I have a personal concern about um, always about uh, the uh, difference between putting recommendations on paper and actually having compliance with recommendations. That's true of my concern when I was in government about regulations as well in terms of what's in the CFR or even on the statute and how it's complied with at agencies. And so um, it was our thought that uh, that this was an appropriate paragraph, but I, I did want to bring it to everyone's attention. Alina, we're not I'm hearing you. Muted. Alina, Alina, I think you're muted. I muted myself during Jason's talk. I apologize. I am. I just asked whether anyone has any comments or reactions or thoughts to uh, to Jason's presentation. Is everyone good? Okay. James Jacobs. Um, I did just want to thank Jason for putting this in here. I think it's a uh, a valuable idea um, for the next uh, committee to think about. So thanks, Dave. Okay. All right. Um, anyone else? All quiet. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to Kirsten. Uh, we have received a total of three sets of comments. Well, the one just came in. Uh, very a very short time ago, and I believe either Kirsten or Jesse will read the fourth set of comments, but um, I'm going to turn now to Kirsten to summarize the few public comments we have received to date. They are posted on the committee website, so certainly everyone is welcome to go look at them. But Kirsten, you want to take it over? Sure, I can summarize these um, from Julie Winstead, who is a privacy FOIA officer at the New Mexico 
Veterans Affairs healthcare system, she um, prefaces her comments to say that they are based on her observing a lack of training at all levels of her organization. She identifies the need for more training regarding creating, maintaining, accessing, and retaining records, as well as more training regarding FOIA. Um, so she supports the recommendations and says that they are needed um, throughout the federal workforce. Uh, we also got a comment from Linda Fry, Senior Government Information Specialist at the Social Security Administration, who brings up a point regarding Recommendation 12. That's the one about um, encouraging agencies to release FOIA documents in open legible, machine readable, and machine actionable formats to the extent feasible. Her comment concerns data integrity. She writes, quote, if this is implemented, how will agencies ensure the data's integrity and that the data will not be falsely represented? Data provided in the recommended format can be manipulated. So that was her comment regarding 12, regarding Kirsten, recommendations. I, Kirsten, let me just yep. pause for a second because I think yep. um, that might warrant just a little bit of feedback from the committee members. Um, sure. And I'm going to turn it over to James. Jacobs. Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to comment on, on Ms. Fry's um, comment. Um, and I think it, it is important to have uh, data integrity, but I, I wanted to assure her um, and, and others who have this concern that um, you know, things like PKI, uh, public key infrastructure, are already used in places like uh, GPO and their GovInfo database um, to assure data integrity of their, of their um, reports and, and documents. Um, and currently, you know, most, most good digital repositories use things like checksums, um, and in fact, it's part of the open archives um, the OAIS standard uh, to, to assure data integrity um, along the whole uh, uh, life cycle and management of, of files, including ingest as well as access. Um, and so I just wanted to assure Ms. Fry, if she's on the call or if she's going to see this later, that um, I, I support her, her, um, her comment but I, I want to assure her that um, that processes are already in place in, in which to assure data integrity. Thanks, James. I appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else want to comment in response to Ms. Fry's comment on 12? Uh, I see Michael raising his hand. Michael Morrissey. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I just want to echo what James said, but also say I think from the requester community, this is sort of a reasoning that we've seen has really undermined the usability of documents, right? Um, I think there's confusion in the requester community why not a single federal agency owns a color scanner, for example, let alone when you get an Excel spreadsheet and you can't actually check those numbers and that sort of thing. Um, and the reality is that even if people do would not provide things in a editable format, bad actors, it's very easy for them to go and forge documents very convincingly no matter how the agency releases it. And I think finding better solutions to this very real problem, um, the solution of providing less usable documents is not actually solving that problem, um, but also really hurting um, the ability to sort of engage with that material in, in very meaningful ways that, um, you know, increases distrust in government in other ways. So I do think it's a problem. I think it would be a great topic to begin to, but um, finding other solutions is really important. Thanks. I, uh, Bobby, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know this is something that you're a little more of an expert in than even I am, and I know you've posted some machine-readable documents on the OIP website. Do you have any thoughts about the ability to protect the integrity of the documents? Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. And the, 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 as I think the rationale and the, the recommendation also illustrate, there's multiple ways of having information be in open and machinable formats. Um, and so um, it, it might just be that some documents are in certain formats 
instances than others where they can still be open, but there's still uh, that confidence that um, there's some protection over the integrity of the data. For example, just um, as opposed to a scan document, uh, making sure that the document is at least OCR'd um, or, or machine readable in that way. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, okay, no, uh, anyone else want to comment on 12 or should we let Kirsten keep going? We're not seeing anyone raising their hand. Kirsten, please carry on. Thank you. So this comment is also from Linda Fry of the Social Security Administration. Uh, it's regarding Recommendation 20, that Congress ensure agencies receive and commit sufficient resources to meet their obligations under FOIA. She notes that a majority of the committee's recommendations depend on this recommendation being implemented. Okay, and then we had one other written uh, comment submitted from a Dr. Paul Moss Rissenhuber from the requester community. Um, a number of his comments do not relate to the work of the FOIA Advisory Committee, so I won't read those. Um, but the ones that do in, relate include that FOIA processors who are contractors, he thinks, should not be able to respond to FOIA requests by saying they are overbroad and or not properly formulated. Um, he also thinks the National Archives should ensure that Privacy Act requests do not require, quote, physical submission of an affidavit of identity claiming American citizenship, but may instead use an email option under 28 U.S.C. 1746, parens 2, to attest to the requester's identity. Finally, he thinks that FOIA requests should not be denied without at least one search by a subject matter expert. So that, those are all the written comments that we received. Okay, any reaction to, to the last set of comments? No. Bobby, uh, not to again call on you, but I'm just wondering, has there been any exploration uh, from the DOJ side about uh, accepting something um, less than the privacy identity waiver currently in use by most agencies? Um, is that something that's been explored? Have you discussed this before? That's yeah, I mean, I think what, what that'll just really go back to is what in the, what is in the agency's regs um, as far as what's acceptable, and um, a lot of the agency regs have more flexibility um, where different forms of uh, certifying your identity is acceptable. Um, okay. But the agency is bound by their regs, so unless they change their regs, that's where they should it would be first looking to as far as how to accept certification of identity. Michael. Yep. Um, yeah, just to kind of follow on with Dr. Uh, Rizanuber's point about um, sort of contractors, I think the broader concern, there is a fair amount of concern within the requester community that, A, we have this wonderful group of sort of trained professionals within government who've been doing this for a long time, bringing in private contractors. Um, a, they're not very transparent themselves in a lot of cases, and B, there's, there's a lot of concerns in some cases justified, in some cases we just don't have enough information that they try to sort of figure out how to deny requests because that's cheaper and, and sort of are putting profits over over transparency. Um, and I think that's that's something we didn't dig into much here, but I think is, is something that's worth flagging for future discussion, whether within this community or within the broader uh, FOIA, FOIA landscape. Michael, I appreciate that. All right, anyone else have any reaction, comments? Emily, was that you raising your hand or no? No, okay. All right, I'm looking around. Everyone looks like that. I would, I would just, add, just add to that before you, just that when agencies are using contractors um, and when they do use them, uh, which can be a, a very a useful resource, um, those contractors should be supervised by FOIA professionals, FOIA officials in the office, so the decisions uh, that they're making should not differ from if um, someone else in the agency is, is making them. Um, and reasonable searches should be conducted and so on. And so it shouldn't bear on 
the type of resource the agency is using, even in the sense when they're using contractors, those contractors can't independently make decisions or, um, or should be supervised by, by actual FOIA professionals in the office. Bobby. Uh, Sean, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, since we're talking about contractors, I just wanted to chime in uh, briefly and, and point out I think Bobby's right that, uh, you know, obviously if you're using uh, FOIA contractors to process FOIAs, that's one thing, but uh, the commenter may have also been talking about agencies using private contractors simply to do some uh, agency program work um, and uh, thereby uh, be a manager, the contractor be a manager of records, and it has been a, a difficult area at times uh, when, when activities are contracted out that, uh, you know, would they normally have been done by agency personnel, there might be a lot of records as to decisions being made and such, and a FOIA requester community often are looking for those things. Uh, and, it, you know, when you use a contractor, it can become a, a bone of contention whether or not uh, those records are now accessible or not through FOIA. And so it might have been uh, also that, not necessarily uh, contractors processing FOIAs, but contractors who are holders of records, uh, which I think is another area that future uh, terms might look into and see if there's uh, recommendations or best practices worth, uh, worth uh, putting forward. Thanks, John. I, I wasn't thinking of it that angle, so thanks. Although we do have an amendment uh, as part of the Open Government Act, right, that was passed that contractor uh, generated records are now subject to the FOIA, so is that sufficient or we need something else? I mean, I think that's the question, if it's sufficient. I don't know how well it's been implemented or how much the boundaries have been tested uh, since that really went into place. Um, and I, I do know um, for, for POGO in particular, um, an area that, that's been of great interest has been uh, private prisons. Um, you know, that uh, both, uh, you know, for immigration purposes, but also for, uh, you know, regular uh, privately controlled prisons um, and the access to records there. Um, so um, I don't know that how much that's been explored through actual FOIA cases. All right, any other comments on the public comments we've received so far? Kirsten, that's it for you, right? Yes, yes that is it for me. So I'm gonna ask uh, Jesse to please uh, let us know if there are any questions or comments on the chat. And we have also received a message uh, from uh, Alex, Alex Howard, uh, who was having trouble accessing our meeting. Hopefully maybe that's something that our folks are working on, but um, Jesse, you were going to read out his comments and let us know if there are any other comments on the chat function. Okay. So first, um, we'll do Alex's comment. And he says, my name is Alex B. Howard, Director of the Digital Democracy Project at Demand Progress Education Fund, a nonprofit focused on open government, among other issues. I've made many public comments at the FOIA Advisory Committee meetings in the past. I write today about three recommendations that are not in the final draft that should be. Number one, the White House Office of Management and Budget removed a cross-agency priority goal for the Freedom of Information Act across the U.S. government. The council should recommend that OMB restore this cap goal. The second one, the Department of Justice took public comment on a release to one, release to all FOIA policy, then buried it. The council should recommend that OIP implement it. And the third, the U.S. Capitol Police are not subject to FOIA, nor are other legislative support agencies or the courts. The council should recommend that Congress enact some mechanism, mechanism by which the public can exercise its right to know across all branches of the U.S. government. As always, thank you for your attention and service. Best, Alex. Apologies, uh, does anyone want to respond to uh, uh, Alex's comment? 
in response to the first comment regarding the cap goal, I think we do capture that in essence with uh, recommendation number 16 for the Chief Board Officer Council to look into um, cross-agency collaborations um, and a, a potential grant program um, that that kind of goes in line with what a cap what we would be doing with a cap goal. And sorry, uh, this is Sean uh, Martin Fargo, uh, and I also think. Uh, that to some extent the uh, recommendation 18 that we just discussed with Tom's changes about um, SIGI, the Council of Inspectors General, uh, getting involved in a cross-cutting uh, you know, priority area uh, also gets to the same uh, tenor and, and uh, goal there. But I did also want to talk about um, his third point, uh, which was about Capitol Police and uh, I mean, we had a, a discussion uh, at, at our last uh, in-person public meeting around uh, applying um, FOIA in some form to, to the other branches of government. There is a mention in the report uh, towards the very end uh, saying that we encourage, uh, you know, a future term uh, to wrestle with this or to consider wrestling with it and see if there's uh, recommendations that can be uh, gotten to. Um, this this, um, this term just didn't have enough uh, time uh, once the issue really had been raised uh, to explore it fully. So uh, I appreciate and I agree that I, I think there are recommendations we can make here, uh, but I also agree with the committee who decided that we didn't have the, the time uh, to commit to, to, to fully uh, uh, explore it. So, uh, and I do think it's mentioned in the report. Yeah, that was also my reaction, Sean, that for number three, I think it's something we could carry over to the next term. So we're not going to bury it. We will definitely have it as a point of discussion for the fourth term. Um, and I know we've addressed in the past, and uh, the director of OIP has made comments in the past about uh, the release to one to release all. I believe the status at DOJ has not changed. With regard to that, I think it's still being considered. Um, uh, and uh, is there any reaction from anyone about whether we should recommend that OIP implement that? Oh, James Jacobs raising his hand. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is James Jacobs, Stanford University. Um, I was just wondering, since since um, several of our recommendations allude to the uh, to, to the issues that Mr. Howard raises, um, if it wouldn't be um, feasible to to at least um, bring those issues that he is concerned about more to the fore in the commenting um, section of, the, of our recommendation. So just so I'm clear, James, I think what you're suggesting then is to the extent that his comment number one with regard to the uh, cap goal, we incorporate that more explicitly in the comment section of recommendation 18 and the SIGI recommendation. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Yes. And then also for three, we could uh, uh, certainly, the working group can do this as a drafting change or just a, a, an amendment to add to the discussion on uh, vision recommendation 3C, right, John? Uh, which is now sort of off track. I don't think it's the recommendation anymore since we took it off the table, but in that narrative, we could add the explicit recommendation that Alex brings forward about the U.S. Capitol Police being subject to FOIA. That's what you're suggesting, James? So i I'm clear. Yeah. yeah. Sean, is that something that's doable? Uh, you know, I certainly think uh, we could, uh, you know, we could uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, some of this uh, takes place. Certainly, Capitol Police uh, could be added uh, to the um, the section where we talk about uh, future um, uh, final observations. Um, my only concern is. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if we can, uh, you know, if we want to take the time uh, 
uh, to try and do that right now uh, and have it read out to the committee since we're trying to vote on the final version, or if there could be a process where, you know, small tweaks like that could be done after uh, this public meeting. I, I just don't know um, to the extent of that. Um, yeah. In terms of the cross-cutting, I mean, I'm not sure for his, his cross-cutting goal, the, the, the CAP goal, uh, I'm not sure I would feel comfortable putting in a reference to the CAP goal, uh, just kind of jamming that in there. I, I, I personally think um, the recommendations get to it without, you know, uh, going in that direction. I don't want to confuse Siggy with something about a, a CAP goal um, when we've got kind of a laid out recommendation for them. I, I, I would say that that one stands alone um, for the, um, the final observations to say something specific about Capitol Police or something I think would be a small change. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if others have um, thoughts. Yeah, James. Thanks, thanks, thanks Sean, for, the, for that clarification. Um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps it could be something um, in a, a wrap-up blog post on, on the Ombud blog or something to that effect that we could um, we could respond to the public comments, um, not just Mr. Howard's, but Ms. Fry's and uh, Ms. Winston's um, public comments as a way to um, to assure people who give comments that we, you know, considered them and worked on them. I agree, though, Sean. Maybe it's uh, it's too much to do some wordsmithing right now. Yeah. I think that's probably true. I, I agree with both Sean and James. I'm also wondering, well, the public comments will be there on the website, so they, they're certainly accessible to everyone. They speak for themselves. We will also post uh, Alex's comments on there as well. Uh, one option is that we could add uh, them as uh, an appendix uh, to the final report. Um, Kirsten and I were just channeling the same thought, great minds think alike. If that's something that folks are interested in, uh, that's something we could just kind of get some verbal cues, nods, if that sounds okay. Um, so if everyone seems okay with that, that might be the best way to go. That way it's all together in one place, one stop shopping. Why wouldn't Why wouldn't we just refer people to the online report uh, uh, comments? And I don't know, it seems to me that in an appendix to the final report elevates them to a position where, you know, people who didn't write in but had some very strong thoughts, uh, I, I don't know, it just seems to me that that, that provides more of a, uh, a stature uh, than uh, the committee's consideration of the comments uh, reflects. With no disrespect to the commenters. No, no, that's a good point. Um, I mean, I think, again, as I said, the comments are already posted. We will also add Mr. Howard's posts on there as well, so they speak for themselves. So everyone is equally comfortable just leaving it as a reference. Suzanne is raising her hand. Yes, Suzanne. <laughs> Hi, this is Suzanne. I, um, I see Tom's point, but, um, and I, maybe not but, but I think the issue is trying to make sure we get the comments to the next committee, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a formal appendix to this report, but somehow when the next committee reads our report, they also can get the comments and um, then they'll have some more time to process them and possibly act on them. Uh, this that was my issue. This is Jason. I, I support that, Suzanne's last comment, uh, but one could, um, supply a, a reply on the online page to say that, to affirmatively say that we will, that the, in the fourth term of the committee, we'll consider public comments received on the last report. So it, it's not that the comments are just received with silence, uh, but there's some commitment uh, to your bringing it up, Alina, or someone, you know, at the, at the next uh, public meeting. Um, I don't think that we should be um, incorporating the, my personal view is that the comments stand by themselves and I 
I do see them as, uh, as something that goes beyond editorial changes that we would need to have a further discussion on. So I, I think it's best to um, have it right over to the next term. How do folks feel about that? So the idea of an appendix is off the table. We're just going to reference on our website the fact that these will be passed over to the fourth term of the committee. So by default, yes. Bobby and Alina need to make sure that we're passing those along based on the charter. Okay, all right. I still like the idea, this is James Jacobs, I still like the idea of adding those comments as an appendix so that the, the next committee uh, group will have uh, both our final report plus the comments all in one place and they won't have to remember to go to the to the OGIS website to see those public comments. Well, uh, Jason, uh, let, let me ask. I'm the lone. Sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry. Let me ask Alina, is the public comment period closed? No, not necessarily. We can certainly continue to receive comments um, through the time that we finalize the report, which is we expect to do at the end of the month. So it's not technically closed, I suppose, but uh, Kirsten, what do you think about that? Um, sure, I think we should be open to receiving more. Um, that said, we did have a cutoff for receiving comments before today's meeting, um, but certainly if others were to make comments, I, I don't think we'd turn them away at this point. Right. It this is Tom Sussman again. To the extent that the comments go, go to what we ought to be doing in the future, I, I would suspect that shortly after the uh, archivist announces uh, a new committee, which he's already announced he's going to appoint, that uh, it would be quite uh, useful to open at that point uh, for public input on what the committee ought to be doing before the first meeting, because I I haven't been in a couple of these where the first meeting is spent, you know, sorting through and brainstorming. We might be way ahead of the game if we have a comment period in advance and refer people to the website for the reports and comments made previously. So that's another idea. Can I, may I take that under advisement? Okay. All right, I think the general consensus is we're going to uh, not include them in an appendix, despite James Jacobs is pleased to the contrary. We're going to reference on our website, well, I guess we'll say two things. One, that we, could, we will continue to accept comments um, through the time that we finalize the report and publish it, and, uh, and we will, uh, and we are acknowledging and thank the commenters for their comments that they've offered up, up through today. Does that sound good to everyone? Okay. All right, um, Jesse, back to you. Any other uh, chat comments or questions that you've seen? Um, Alina, no, there are no additional chat comments. Okay, thank you so much, Jesse, I appreciate it. Okay, so, um, uh, over to our event producer, I'd like to ask um, if you could open up the phone lines now to see if we have any uh, comments via telephone. And if you could please remind our participants, or attendees rather, uh, instructions for chiming in, that would be great. As we move to Q&A, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. Once again, dial pound two to ask a question or leave a comment over the phone. First caller, your line is unmuted. Hello, this is Alex Howard. Uh, glad I was able to attend the meeting. Um, I hope that uh, if the virtual conditions uh, continue, you'll be able to put a live stream uh, that does not require a registration link uh, for the public to attend um, this public meeting. I understand that there are significant technical uh, constraints that exist right now, but um, choosing a platform that doesn't require uh, registration from a private company would be great. 
Um, I sent in uh, three comments on the draft to the email address provided. Um, hopefully they'll be filed uh, in the docket. Um, they're not new ones, but I did not see them in the draft, uh, specifically uh, recommending that OMB put back a cap goal, that's cost agency priority goal for FOIA, um, that office information policy, if you release the release to one, released all policy I've been asking the committee about uh, for years. Um, and finally, they recommend to Congress to explore some kind of statutory mechanism for people to request uh, information from um, legislative and a judicial branch. Um, in particular, uh, given what we're seeing across the country, uh, having the U.S. Capitol Police not be uh, transparent and accountable through something like FOIA um, seems to me to be uh, a significant oversight that should be rectified. Um, thank you very much for taking the steps you have to create this public meeting, um, the robust discussions you have, uh, and the recommendations in general, um, which, uh, if implemented, um, would do much to improve the state of FOIA. Okay. Um, Alex, thank you very much for your comments. I, I don't know whether you were able to hear the committee's deliberations about your comments and the rest of the public comments we've received. Uh, but the committee has agreed to continue to retain the public comments on our website, and we will um, incorporate them into a discussion for the next term of the committee So um, to see whether they can be addressed by the fourth term. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Vijay, do we have anyone else on the line? Any other callers? One more time, ladies and gentlemen, please dial pound two to ask a question or give a comment. There is no one else on the line. Okay. All right, well, um, that concludes our public comment section of, um, of this process. And um, I am eager to, vote, uh, to move on to the vote on the final report unless someone is going to tell me they have something else that they want to raise with the committee members before we move forward. No, I'm seeing no from Bradley, thank you. No, Sean, okay. I'm seeing most no's. Um, okay, so um, as a package with the uh, language tweaks that we discussed today um, and that at times were read out loud by either me or Kirsten, um, I would like to take a vote on the report. I do want to promise that the working group, I'm going to, you know, make them uh, read this one more time. They didn't know that I was going to ask that, but I will. Um, Jason, I think, has already read and given some comments, but um, our goal is to make sure all the commas are in the right place, all the grammatical uh, errors are fixed, that there's only one space between each sentence as opposed to two spaces. So we're going to try to clean that up as much as possible. We will not obviously mess with anything substantive, but it will look fabulous once we're done. Um, so with that in mind, um, may I ask uh, for a final vote on the, the draft final report that we have in front of us today? Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Tom. Do I have a second? Second. 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 <laughs> second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I heard a bunch of ayes. Um, all those uh, not in favor, please say nay. Not hearing any nays. Um, any abstentions? This is Bobby. Um, I'm, I am abstaining, but I, I'm looking forward to working on all these recommendations. But just be consistent, I am abstaining. Okay, and this is Alina Fimo for consistency as well. I'm just abstaining on those recommendations that involve OGIS in particular, which is really just about all of them, right? Um, no, <laughs> but, um, uh, several of them, but uh, I am otherwise in favor as well, and Bobby and I are excited to be able to work together collaboratively to, to move all these forward. So um, we've all done a great job. So with that, um, I believe we have unanimous approval, Kirsten. Do you want to we read do, that indeed. Yes. So the final report and recommendations of the advisory committee 
passes unanimously with two abstentions, Bobby and Alina. Okay. All right. Um, any other thoughts or comments that anyone wants to make before we uh, start wrapping things up? Oh. Okay. Um, so, again, I just want to thank all of you for the amazing work you've done, not just today, but for the duration of this two-year term. Um, I am truly, truly grateful for all the hard work, thoughtfulness, and dedication I have seen throughout this whole process, uh, both at the subcommittee and the committee level. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, again, I want to invite um, all of those out there watching to go to OGIS's website for our social, and our social media um, websites for more information about activities and how you can participate or comment. And if there are no other uh, comments, members, I want to thank you again for uh, joining us today. I uh, wish everyone only health and safety and hope that everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. And uh, we will reconvene the fourth term of the committee this fall. So any questions or concerns? Yeah, I'm seeing clap. I think we mm -hmm. should clap for ourselves. Um, all right, well, not hearing anything else, I'm seeing lots of claps. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, the 2018-2020 term of the Floyd Advisory Committee stands adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great Thank afternoon. Thank you. back the gift of about an hour and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was great working with Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great working with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Conclude our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced.